It's a real pleasure to have Sheila Kennedy and Frano Violic with us this evening to present the work of their practice, KVA. It's particularly a pleasure for me. I've known of and followed with admiration KVA's work since I was a student at a school that will remain unnamed tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Already then, Professor Kennedy had a reputation for being a unique and groundbreaking educator, committed to advancing her students' design capacities and intellectual breadth as she strived to broaden their approach and understanding of what architecture is and what it can do, not only as a discipline and a practice, but also for the public good and the world at large. Student work coming out of her design studios was always impressive and the envy of many other students and studios as it combined great intellectual rigor and a dedication to thorough experimentation through material, innovation, and a focus on making, opening up new possibilities for architecture to engage reality through materiality. Her studio's cutting edge explorations, which pushed burgeoning computational and fabrication technologies towards the performative rather than the merely formal, stood in stark contrast to the more conservative formal attitudes which prevailed across schools at the time. Since then, I have continued to be impressed with KVA's intellectual and critical contributions, and especially their early and in many ways pioneering commitment to design research as a form of practice. KVA's material research unit, KVA Mat X, has put forth in fresh ways how material experimentation can today be generative for architecture at a larger scale, weaving together localized cultural knowledge and production with broader questions around energy, global, global urbanization, and climate change. As with their early portable light project, which was exhibited as part of MoMA's design and the Elastic Mine in 2008, KVA's ability to develop a technology which cuts, cut across the fields of architecture, material research and development, product and fashion design, demonstrated design's agency in enabling social, political, and environmental engagement through design and architecture. Today, KVA's practice is yielding some of the most compelling environmental and technological thinking and work at the building scale. From their interactive building parts, such as with the 34th Street Public Ferry ter Terminal, to the smart curtains and shades of the soft house, and to the digital brick veneer of their Tozer Anthropology <coughs> building, amongst many other projects, KVA's work inspires us to think across scales and systems with precision, but also with imagination, as they strive to create new living typologies and experiences, always skillfully integrating hard and soft infrastructures towards the reimagining of low carbon living for the future. I think it's fair to say that very few architectural practices today have succeeded in bridging technological performance with the pleasure of architectural experience and creative design and aesthetics with an unwavering commitment to social and environmental engagement. Through teaching, research, and practice, they have drawn together a highly complex and contemporary set of ingredients and concerns to produce an equally complex and varied architecture understood as a constantly reinvented form of knowledge and practice, as well as a powerful form of advocacy for a more sustainable human footprint on the planet. Both of them continue to be committed educators, Sheila as a professor of professional practice at MIT, and Fano as a regular distinguished visiting professor in many of the grade schools around the country. Please join me in welcoming Sheila Kennedy and Fano Violich. Thank you very much. Um, you could carry on with that. It was quite, quite nice. Thank you. Um, uh, and do I? Uh, do you switch this over? Thank you. Okay. So um, it's a real pleasure to be here um, with so many people that we know um, and to be standing here. It seems that we were here a short while ago um, for the symposium um, on uh, energy and, in particular, embodied energy that was organized here by David Benjamin and others. And um, if you're interested in the kind of written version of this talk, um, I would refer you to our piece, uh, the piece that I wrote uh, in, in, in that book. But what we're going to do tonight is a little bit different, and I think it will be uh, um, 
well, it's certainly going to be nice for us because we're speaking together. I'm going to take the first part of this talk, Frano, the middle, and then I'll try to corral things up um, at the end, if that sounds good to you. Um, so um, tonight, we're going to be proposing three partial paradigms, three kind of imperfect um, paradigm shifts uh, as a way to sort of organize our, our work. And we'll be talking really about our work in practice tonight and less so um, the work that Frano and I do uh, with students when we, when we teach. Um, before I begin, I do want to recognize those people at KVA Maddox who contributed to the projects that we're going to share with you tonight, um, including a couple of folks who um, are probably here uh, still at Columbia. So what we want to do is kind of open up a polemic, uh, which is a little bit different um, um, than you might expect, perhaps, of KVA Maddox. Um, this is the, uh, the march uh, uh, that occurred, uh, the Women's March, here in New York City. But it really could have been a scene from um, the testimony that happened last week. Um, and there is a thought um, that one hears across many um, uh, schools of architecture and from many young architects that somehow politics uh, lie outside of architecture, that we need to hit the streets, um, get out there, agitate, and vote, and we do. But there is then a kind of a polarity between this image of, of an engaged citizen outside of architecture and the kind of idea that architecture is um, a world of forms that can be exchanged fairly and perhaps unfairly, as Anna Miyake um, has argued at MIT. And this, these are kind of two poles. And we would like to present a spectrum of ideas that might inhabit the fairly large um, divide between these kind of uh, ideas. And um, this image is, is a, an image that we, we uh, we look to a lot. There are many. We have a collection of kind of labels and also a collection of advertisements. But the same forces that are kind of organizing our very unusual political moment outside of architecture are operating on how we do architecture, but we tend to not see that. So the incorporation of uh, all materials in architecture, um, the corporate kind of hold on um, our major architectural components, ceilings, walls, and floors, um, is, is uh, something that is transparent, and we think sometimes that in order to be political, we have to hit the streets. So we want to argue, um, or at least propose, or at least provoke, that an architect is political by being at the center of her or his discipline and by taking back the wall, which is a phrase that we use, um, which means sort of looking again at how we can alter the materials and systems of practice while still being in practice. And, and that's the trick. And of course, this is the trick, too, um, the blue marble. Um, we live in a, uh, on, on, a, on a planet. Um, good planets are hard to find. And um, this one is small. Um, and so in this, in this sort of uh, iconic um, Apollo image of the Earth, um, which was called, actually, a, given a material name, the blue marble, um, we understand how everything must be understood together. There really is no away uh, from our planet. Um, so running through um, the thread of this talk um, is the idea of soft design, which is quite simply put an act of the imagination that understands nature, all of nature, all of technology, and um, all of the built environment as a single spatial system. So this sounds uh, trivial to say. Uh, so what? What's the problem with that? Um, but then you begin to think that there is no away. You do not throw something away. You throw something into. You throw something into something else. And so um, all of these constructs that we've inherited, which is part of this apparatus uh, of walls that has been set up um, that we've inherited from modernism, um, is, is uh, not trivial to try to imagine beyond. So I'm going to show uh, two projects relatively quickly that take up the imperfect paradigm of nature factory, two words that we graft together very uh, deliberately. We think we might think of one as being sort of industrialized and the other is not. But as we'll see, these two terms actually kind of uh, um, imprint on each other and, and overlap. Uh, the first project is a project that we did recently um, in France. It's called Climalin. 
Um, and so it plays with the idea of climate, climat, lin, which is linen, material, and also malin, which is a kind of French word for street smart. Um, so all of these things are kind of wrapped together in this line of soft goods that we developed uh, with uh, Le Maître des Mystères, who's a weaver of linen in France, and Bouchara, who's a distributor of textiles also in, in France. So linen is pretty amazing. Um, it's a kind of highly unnatural, natural material. Um, it blooms one day a year, and in Lille, in the northern part of France, the hills are like completely blue like this, while the flax plant blooms. Um, it's a, also an ancient material. Um, you know, you might think that we work with new materials, but increasingly we're working with extremely old materials, and linen is no exception. And um, it's been used um, for um, thousands of years for its absorptive uh, qualities. And so our client approached us, Olivier Ducatillon, he's the gentleman in blue, uh, and he asked us uh, to electrify linen. He said, could you put LED lights in it and maybe make it conduct electricity? And we said, you know, I, I, uh, maybe, um, but let's look at what linen is and um, let's look at what its properties are and let's see if we can kind of turn up the volume on those properties and augment them in some way. So we got to know Olivier and his, uh, his loom. He has these very old kind of pre-World War II Dobie looms, um, which are uh, mechanical uh, but not automated. Um, and he uh, weaves 100% natural linen which are grown right outside uh, his, his, uh, his river in the fields. So we began to look at absorption kind of on a different register in this project. And we began to look at wasted heat in the environment. Um, all the sources, the small little, uh, a million, it's like a million and one things about her um, that are giving off heat right now. For example, at this podium, um, the screen, the computer, the lights, but also in the world, your car seat, your radiator, um, your cook pot, your thermos, anything that might be containing heat that's just kind of, we're not amortizing in any way, it's just escaping into the atmosphere. And we thought about how we might be able to capture and hold that heat um, and or coolness with a 100% uh, natural phase changing material that's made out of uh, vegetable wax. So working with another French company, Winco, um, that makes this phase changing material, um, our clients wanted us to develop a super absorptive kind of supra natural linen um, that would absorb heat um, and cooling um, and be, be a kind of a, a, a supra, supra natural but still 100% natural linen material. So we started um, with the uh, Winko face changing material coated on the back and of course the linen absorbed this very quickly. And then using Poincaré, which is kind of a fun uh, textile software um, where you can define every warp and every weft, and it also matches up really well with, with the Adobe looms, you can take this digital output and you can um, analog it with a, um, a mechanized loom. We were able to define um, where all the threads could be, phase changing threads, and also uh, threads that could um, change uh, according to temperature. So um, just, we're just going to show you one project here. It's, um, it's a uh, scarf. Uh, it's a, called the Borrow Scarf. And it's a, a, a scarf that borrows your heat uh, or your cooling from the atmosphere and plays it back to you. So the, it's a pretty simple gesture. Um, the, the scarf is made out of linen. Um, and it's 100% natural linen with 100% natural phase changing material in it. And you would start by just like tossing it onto your radiator. Um, and as the material begins to take on the ambient heat from the radiator, it changes color as the thermochromic thread begins to be activated. So a kind of like flax-like pattern um, begins to appear on this. Uh, here is Davis uh, wearing one of the first prototypes. The kind of interesting thing was that this linen is manufactured by the meter, many, many meters of the same material with the same weave. But depending on who you are and how hot you are, um, you get a different heat signature uh, in this. So you create your own pattern depending on whether you're, you've been biking or whether it's winter or summer, or if you're sitting down and relaxing and so forth. So it's a way of kind of uh, having your body um, your body's own heat and its response to this material on your scarf um, create uh, its own its own pattern. So it's 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 mass customizing um, with a mass produced material. And here's KVA's own Ben Widger 
um, uh, bicycling into Maison et Objet, which is where uh, all of our Climalin soft goods were, were shown last year. The next project I want to I want to talk about in terms of the um, uh, nature factory uh, paradigm is Thicket. I could really call this Thicket and Islands. Um, this is a very different scale project. It's a large city building project um, that KVA did with 32 riverfront organizations and Tom Leader Landscape Studio uh, in Berkeley. And uh, we were responsible for uh, a competition where we uh, uh, competed with a couple of other uh, architects internationally for this five mile stretch of the river, Mississippi River, here in downtown Minneapolis. And uh, we won the competition, and uh, the project has been unrolling, and I'll catch you up real quickly on what has been happening. Um, this is um, St. Anthony's Falls right here. And this is a very impaired part of the Mississippi. It has um, a lot of pollution, less so from the heavy industry that used to be along and still is along the edges, much more so from 1,001 sort of innocent gestures, from your aunt putting fertilizer on her lawn, um, from uh, the, the, the salt that you might put on winter streets, all that bringing nitrogen and bringing salt um, into the river. So the first thing that we did with our team was to kind of repropose a new map of the city, a map that would superimpose um, all of the urban water systems, um, which you can see there in blue, the daylight, uh, daylighted uh, storm drainage uh, uh, confluence, the, the flow, urban flows of water into the natural flow north-south of the Mississippi here, um, superimposed against the flyway, which is a great bird uh, migration way, with all of the kind of species, wanted or unwanted, loved or unloved, that currently inhabit um, that stretch of the river. Um, there's a massive amount of wood on site, um, old railway ties and so forth. And working with Jan Nippers, we developed a, a kind of an L-beam solid bridge um, where we could amass uh, all of this wood um, and uh, curve in order to create strength and bring people to the waterfront um, for the first time in a long time. So you can see here an image of these bridges that kind of turn and they dive and sort of jump and dive over uh, portions of the river where of the parks, the National Parks Department doesn't have access. So we can't wait around for all the land to be acquired. So this was kind of an agile wooden trail system that sort of jumped the rails and formed some connectivity along um, the Mississippi. So it's all made out of this sort of massive timber. And you can see it kind of curving there in the background as it jumps from point to point, not landing on anybody's property that doesn't want it. Um, they asked us to put a lot of birds um, in the rendering on this project, actually, and we, we obliged. Um, and it was really a fascinating kind of backstory to this because um, everybody in Minneapolis really wants the eagles to come back, the American eagles, the great majestic birds that once um, inhabited this part of the river. Um, but nobody really wants the, the bee larvae um, to come back. But if you look at the food chain, of course, the bee larvae is instrumental to the food of the minnows, which is inst instrumental to the larger uh, river trout and so forth that the birds need. So to increase the carrying capacity of the river, besides bringing people to the river and bringing their attention to the state of the river, we also had to try to get the insects to come back to the river. So in the nature factory paradigm, we sort of looked at nature's debris, not as debris, but actually as a sort of a, a actual ready-to-go building material, if you will. So every year, the, the river brings tons and tons of driftwood and, and wash up uh, wood. And through Thicket, the Thicket project, we tried to organize this wood. Um, we tried to um, find ways that it could become a kind of cladding. And we put a sort of a little uh, bee sugar on the ends so that our bees could begin to kind of burrow into this thicket so it could begin to be eaten away by the insects and changed out every year when the tides came, so, uh, the winter floods came and ebbed. The story about islands is just very brief. Um, there was a uh, island, uh, an important island, that was uh, here called Halls Island, one of many in the Mississippi. And then to get the channels uh, going for barges, these islands were gradually either taken out um, or appropriated. And in fact, Halls Island was bought for um, $95,000. 
um, and it became a parking lot, um, and that was the site of the first development. So our project, River First, proposed to um, actually uh, recreate and restore, remove the dredged material to restore Halls Island and create the first sort of natural river park um, that you will be able to swim in, um, certainly in the um, upper Mississippi and certainly in the Minneapolis area. So we are involved in designing the park building with a thicket cladding um, and also in the design of the park. And it's not every day um, that you uh, get to make an island. Um, so this is sort of an odd uh, nature factory kind of imagery of what could be terraforming or is it actually natural, uh, natural restoration uh, as the dredge is removed from this island and the island itself um, begins to take, the island that was always there begins to um, appear. This is what that island looks like today. Um, and we also made an app called River Talk, um, which will talk about the history and the future of the river. So uh, Frano's up next. Um, he's going to be talking about um, the paradigm of perpetual building. Thank you, Sheila. I'd like to now explore the idea of the perpetual building, the second paradigm, through the concept of opacity and the material paradox that the discipline of architecture has constructed around the idea of masonry and its status as a contemporary building material. Throughout history, the thickness of brick has been characterized by its permanence, its excess, its messy, transformation from clay to a unitized building block, contributing to the architectural idea of the habitable, habitable poche. But we now know this is not the case. We see examples here, for instance, the drone mason that dematerializes the brick entirely. It becomes super light and can now fly through the air at will, except for one problem, as we know, this is not actually a brick. It's a block of polystyrene due to the weight limitations of this digital mason. Guided by parametric algorithms, the brick has become thin, a digital bit of information. The fiction is a brick that is fully digital and fully controlled in a Euclidean universe that is knowable, governed by geometry, and the resultant of finite element analysis. And then we have the singular tectonic image of Denis Villeneuve's 2016 film, Arrival, which I'm sure you've all seen. The opaque, weightless mass of a monolithic spaceship that effortlessly, effortlessly floats silently above the Earth, evoking carved black masonry, stone, the vessel's strangely familiar material is, a rem is reminiscent, of, uh, reminiscent of naturally occurring spaces and structures such as grottos, caves, and concretions. Yet it also suggests an unknowable and utterly alien nature that is free from the earthly forces of rational Newtonian physics. This, this new interest in, in opacity poses an obvious question, yet one that is often left unasked. From what materials will this new architecture be constructed? And who will make it? The architectural choice and treatment of this impassive materiality presupposes a position of fabrication that is caught between the artifice of thinness and the artifice of history and impossible return to historical narratives, narratives of thickness to a raw natural material that is simply formed. So at the Tazer Anthropology Building that was built about uh, two and a half years ago, we were interested in, in this kind of conundrum between the thick and the thin. How could we begin to work with, as Amal mentioned, a veneer building in ways that 
provided the kind of thickness of the material that we've understood for many, many, many years, for centuries, 6,000 years to be precise. So we inherited this building, uh, which is, you can see uh, the one in the, in the middle there, sort of a classic vintage 1970s building, two-story library. And we were asked to transform that and add two stories to it. But with this building came all kinds of issues that were confronted in the 1970s, or at least people forgot about. It wasn't accessible. The walls were so thin in terms of the cavity that uh, mildew and mold was growing. Um, but most importantly, it really lacked the kind of identity that this anthropology, de anthropology department was looking for. So this was the transformation, transformation of the building to something that really began to understand and challenge this idea of thickness uh, and yet at the same time understanding that we were using conventional materials, conventional construction techniques. We were working with, with, uh, with masons who knew how to build veneer brick, but they didn't know how to br build the brick that we've, but that we've come to understand through history. So what the challenge was, was to, cr to create a, an entrance where we really focused our attention on a surface, and a surface that, that was then folded. So how do you fold brick? So we began to use through, through parametric designs ways that we could find just that kind of right angle where both the, the, the raking and the, and the corbeling of the facade could meet at a fold point which you see here in this image. Are we advancing? There we go. So here you can see the technical, uh, the technical details of the wall which, and its fold, which starts at the bottom and moves up to, to the left. It was really interesting in that the contractor, uh, the mason, the, 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 the mason who, who laid the brick, looked at this, build, looked at this part of the, uh, the building and said, there's no way I'm going to do this. Uh, the, I cannot build this. So fortunately, the, the uh, general contractor took it on as a project. And um, it was, um, you know, it really took working with the union. Uh, this is the local three in Dorchester, uh, the uh, allied bricklayers. And coming to, to grips with the, the fact that you just have to start to lay this out. You have to stack it with dry stacking, uh, try, trying to find that fold seam, um, uh, and, and finding ways to use veneer brick in order to provide the kind of depth that we were looking for. And as they began to build uh, the, the, the wall, you know, questions came up. Uh, for example, we didn't want to have a control joint. For a wall of this size, you would have to have a control joint someplace. You, you have a limit to what you can do with veneer before you start to uh, get a kind of cracking. And so this, this wall maxes my, maximizes that, and there an, isn't a single control joint uh, in the entire wall. And so after this, you begin to understand this kind of thickness. And then as you enter the project, you notice that there's a kind of very thin liner on the inside. And this is sort of the heart or the home of the anthropology department. It's where uh, they meet, uh, it's their living room space. And what we were interested in, in doing was creating a, um, a kind of grafting, uh, a way to, in a way, misuse the wood wall. We were interested in creating perhaps even a different species of wall. <laughs> A wall that combined many different things, C combined light, lighting, um, combined acoustic performance, so that, you know, it's like, you know, how many times do we see the edge grain of plywood and say, oh, that's a new species? We're really trying to push the idea of wood into something, something other through this kind of idea, this fantastic idea that you find of, of, in nature. So looking at that interior liner began to combine these different systems in terms of their uh, performant, performative values. Um, you can see here the acoustic material, which is just alder, also coincidentally made out of alder, 
uh, alder branches. Um, so we're using wood materials and wood materials, uh, different species, to make this kind of new, this new material. A view of that uh, interior space, the natural light coming down. Another view there. And um, so in this project in, in Rochester, we're trying to take this, uh, this idea even further of working with uh, masonry and, and working with the kind of thinness of masonry, uh, in a, in a, working with a program which is an unusual program. This is University of Rochester. It's a data science institute. It's a new data science being a new department and a new di discipline which is trying to redefine itself, needed to find a place that was highly flexible, a series of large laboratories, a lot of circulation space where people from different departments could come to this building and run into each other, sort of disrupt their, their daily routine, routines, disrupt, in fact, their research modalities by coming here from the sciences and from the arts, from languages, from history. This is what data science is, is the place where people mine the data in as part of their research. So we were asked to make this sort of very simple box, if you will, and we, then we broke the box uh, to begin to allow the, uh, the, 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 the program uh, inside to, to uh, be expressed. Uh, you can see here its, it's, it's, uh, it's position on the campus. It became uh, the, the last building to close the campus, so it became a very important space for, uh, for, for the campus. And so how then, if you're doing something that's highly flexible that has this kind of veneer on it and tries to maximize the space for people to meet on the inside, we were forced right to the edge of the skin. And so we began to challenge ourselves on how could we transform that brick. And we began to be interested in the identity of the building, the, the fact that through kind of associations of windows and the kind of binary of the one and the zero combined could create a kind of elevation or a facade, which is really very important to any, any building. Uh, but particularly in brick, it becomes quite a challenge, especially in, in, in with contemporary construction. A kind of streaming, uh, streaming information uh, falling through uh, the, 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 the building facade, which you can see here. This, this building was just open in the uh, last fall. So, so we've come full circle. Brick as a, as a contested material paradox made with mud and perceived as the thick matter of raw earth, something that is incredibly primitive and worked by hand in a mix of wet, thick, heavy, malleable mud. This is really what happens. You've seen very crisp kind of detailing and elevations, but this is the, the sort of backstory of this, uh, of this material. However, in some ways, this is really just a fiction um, a fiction of brick as an authentic matter with the capacity to somehow express an abstract and pure Newtonian world that is ruled by gravity and human labor. It's, it, there, is, there, there is an alternative. So this friction frames a contemporary narrative of opacity that fuses archaic and contemporary attitudes toward materiality, tectonics, and form uh, uh, an intertwined strategy that is increasingly present in architecture today. Work by my students at the same university that Mama mentioned, which we'll go and mention, uh, uh, architects like Barozzi Viega, uh, Jimenez Lai, Christy uh, Balliet, uh, Brandon Clifford, and others are kind of interested in this kind of modality. This work signals a renewed engagement with this matter, a clear distancing from transparency as the predominant aesthetic of modernism and cultural expression of modern technology. Instead of aggregating bricks, for example, as predetermined individual units, we might think of them as a contemporary material that is both digital and physical. This reconception would conflate material surface and an expanded autonomy of form while still recognizing the complexity of brick's messy theater of construction. Its wet mortar, unrelenting weight, 
and relationship to industry, material uh, extraction, and labor. Not only should the tension between surface image and tectonic construct be re revisited, but also the political should be sought in the discourse of the tectonic. In the refusal to make transparent architecture's dependency on various forms of labor, material provenance, and manufacturing, perhaps ironically, this new opacity could recode the lack of agency that haunts the discipline of architecture in our contemporary moment. While it is always tempting to subscribe to an aesthetic meta-narrative, this opacity does not glow. It's not animated from within, but from without. A, a blank and mural surface upon which a discipline's desires can be projected. Opacity is not a static condition or simply the lack of transpar transparency. It is an active, deliberate, and perpetual building strategy that acknowledges a productive ambiguity of possible readings and narratives while refusing to choose among them. Mm. Sheila, would you like to take your turn? Thank you. Our third partial paradigm is um, unpacking the wall. And if we think about the wall as a kind of conceptual uh, handbag, um, we want to open it up, lift it up, and shake out the contents. Um, and um, open the wall, and by wall I mean all the surfaces of architecture, to those things that are not architecture. Um, and in this next couple of projects, um, we're gonna talk about the work that KVA has done um, in kind of examining the inner contents of the wall, and in particular, uh, putting infrastructure on the table. Um, this project for the, the, uh, e, the East, 30, uh, East 34th uh, ferry terminal may be familiar to you. And here we're really trying to um, let the uh, water itself uh, become an actor. Um, we're, in the next couple of projects, we're looking at natural forces uh, like water, wind, um, to become uh, architectural agents, to be incorporated in the architecture and, and to speak. Um, the site is uh, East 34th Street, and we're familiar with this view of the water in Manhattan. It's the horizon, um, it's the surface, the mirrored surface on which the ferry boats go forth and back. Um, but underneath is an important um, body of water that few people in the city know about, that it is not in fact a river, but it's an estuary that has tidal flows each day that connects um, uh, Manhattan with its freshwater reservoir. Um, up, um, up in the uh, estuary here, um, connect. So these flows that move back and forth um, are really what flush out um, and and protect the kind of freshwater body uh, for for the city. So in the ferry project, um, we wanted to um, go beneath the surface and go above the surface of the water. So it turns out that every city has these ambient digital layers, um, and in New York City. Uh, the GPS system was sort of unamortized. It exists on Staten Island. It was there when the harbor was booming after World War II. And so we appropriated this uh, GPS system for real-time passenger messages, for the ferry boat commuters, um, for um, working, um, for um, uh, using your mobile phone, um, and also to tell us something about um, the river itself. East 34th Street Ferry, was quite quite a successful uh, ferry landing. It's catalyzed a lot of development in its area. And um, we developed a system. Um, we make these kind of kooky little videos to um, show kind of animation. But as boats come in and as the current is flowing in one direction, uh, these three uh, skylights uh, in the roof canopy of the ferry station take on different colors and different speeds that reflect the flows underwater of the, uh, of the river. So its direction, its speed, and when people come across, as they are doing now, there's a kind of an energy and an interruption in the system um, that, uh, that, that tells people that uh, if you're looking down on this, uh, to come and catch the ferry. 
So fortunately, we have a, uh, a celestial body that's very steady and not likely to change in the moon. And so we can use the internet to accurately predict um, all the tides of the East River uh, for the next, reliably, for the next 105 years um, and, and even arguably thereafter. Um, and so with uh, our interaction designer, David Small, we developed a system. You can see the lines, the purple lines are this kind of energy or noise um, in the system when people cross underneath it that can use rings of LEDs in the skylights to designate the flow direction and also the speed of the currents of the East River. So we're trying to use the, 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 the fa fantastic thing about building on a pier is that you have this long horizontal aspect. And so we're using the reflectivity of the water to um, kind of correct and double the proportions and also bring this other character, which is the movement of the water uh, into the architecture. Um, this project was built almost entirely off site. Um, and this is the kind of example of super dumb construction that sometimes can be smart. Um, we have a very a simple masonry structure that's sort of ultra cheap. It's clad with a mostly, um, uh, a mostly simple uh, uh, system. And then we have a little bit of steel and two layers of, of textile canopy, ETFE, uh, here. Uh, and you can see here one of these uh, oculuses, these skylights, kind of hanging down like socks. Um, these would then be tied to the taut inner lining. And the only structural problem that we had um, with our engineer, Michael Stein, um, working was the problem of kiting, the, the potentiality that the roof might actually lift up and, and fly away. So you can see um, the kind of uh, effects, the moiré effects between the double layers of, of uh, wall and also the, the skylight uh, with its uh, ring of, of LEDs. Um, yeah, it's connected with City Bike now. Um, and I'd like to also talk about Soft House in the same way as kind of expanding and opening up architecture to this time the, the, the force of wind and the ability uh, to actually see wind and understand that the domestic, um, the domestic uh, theater, we could call it, is not separate from that which is outside, but really they're one and the same. And this is sort of challenging to do in a passive house in Germany because uh, the passive house is predicated on a very intense singular barrier um, uh, with triple glazed glass and very limited amounts of glass and um, a lot of different material elements that are, are welded, literally welded together and that are hard to disentangle at the end of the life of a building. So we began to look at, at the sort of uh, uh, turning mechanisms of plants um, and of course the sunflower is very well known, the young sunflowers uh, actually track the sun and, and at night they returned back to their original kind of neutral position. And so we became sort of fascinated with the idea that we could have a canopy that could actually uh, move and track the sun and harvest energy. So this was another uh, international competition for the uh, IBA uh, in Hamburg, the International Baustung that KVA won um, with our team of um, of uh, German engineers, headed once again by Jan Nippers, who we work with a lot. Um, and uh, the idea here was also super dumb, um, a podium um, of uh, work and two stories of residential above and a canopy made out of flexible solar materials that could adjust for summer and winter and that could turn to the east and the west, this project is facing due south, um, and track the sun as it, as it moves. So we became very uh, sort of fascinated with um, the different kinds of ways that collective energy harvesting could become the public identity of this building. Um, and uh, we had about a year with our team um, to bring this technology into fruition. Um, and uh, the German Federal Republic gave all architects challenges and we had three challenges to develop the flexible technology, the, we call them twisters on the exterior to make a solid uh, all wood construction, which I'll talk about in a second, and also to make the smart curtains that carry LED light deep into um, these kind of long uh, box-like residences. 
So a year is not a long time um, to um, make new technology, make it meet building code, and also make it meet passive house German standards. Um, but Jan Nipper, I thought I would show you Jan Nippers here, brave man that he is, who agreed to work with us on this project um, to test and develop all of the infrastructure. And he's here uh, uh, testing the twisting power of this to lock up and become tight in situations of storm. Jan also was a proponent of the um, Brett Stopfel uh, building construction. This is an all wood construction that's super simple. We did not go to a corporate entity like Finn Forest or um, CLT manufacturer, but just to a local a wood builder, a Holtzbau in the region, who takes dowels of hardwood and hammers them into bunches of softwood, just like you can see. And that softwood sequesters a ton of carbon. These are the four units on the truck nearby to the site, being driven to the site, and then set up on the site. We used uh, natural sheep's wool insulation. All of these kinds of uh, kind of very radical uh, nature materials, um, Serge Ferrari uh, building fabric, and then natural larch, which is regionally what they do for a rain screen in this part of Germany. And we are actually able to get rid of the traditional barriers that would normally be constructed between units, right? There are four units. And normally, you would have a wall between um, these units. But we are able to kind of just suggest the division of property by the, by the uh, tensile member that comes down and the little ladder that's connected to it so that you have a free terrace and that kind of expression of, of, of harvesting energy together. Um, the sections are very important to us. Um, you can see the different positions of the twisters, and um, the, uh, uh, there's a, a water pumps, DC water pumps, and um, uh, battery charging for last mile car service for the residence's uh, electronic vehicles. And then the uh, squares in orange show the uh, curtains, which do everything that a normal curtain does, um, but also more. Um, when you have a solid wood structure, uh, where does infrastructure go? I mean, you've kind of blown up the hollow wall and you've made a kind of thickened wood wall. And so we were able to kind of make vertical chases where we needed to for some of the plumbing. And then we developed a technology um, for the distribution of a very low voltage electricity, um, which was curtain tracks, which you can see here, and curtains that move um, and become a kind of an actor reflecting light um, in the house um, in this very, very simple, kind of very reduced um, architectural interior. And as those curtains move, um, they create little mini rooms, um, uh, very much like how uh, in ancient times um, you would put a tapestry around your bed. So these are sort of instant um, microclimate rooms that occur from the curtains reflecting your heat and picking up on the heat um, from the um, radiant floor in winter. Um, this is a, a video, it's pretty subtle, um, but it's showing that as the wind blows the trees very gently outside, the light moves at that same speed through these curtains. So this is one of many applications that you can have for the curtains. We call this one the visual breeze. Um, and I'll just end this section on the soft house with um, a video from Swedish television. Um, we didn't design that birdhouse, um, but it did get placed there. It's kind of weird when you're designing a speculative um, housing development. You don't know these people. Um, they are simply living in the soft house. All of the units are sold. And they've actually elected to have their kitchen downstairs in the workspace. You can see how the curtains move. They do curtainy things like subdivide space. Then um, you'll see in a minute upstairs, they move from a normative position against the, um, against the windows into this kind of more intimate figural position um, by the bed. So I'll show you uh, really quickly last couple of projects, um, ratchet strap pop-up. Um, this could have gone in perpetual building because it's about the churn of, of uh, the churn of tenant spaces. Um, but we became very interested in how we could get away without any walls. So this is totally unpacking the wall and putting everything into um, furniture. And so from a single sheet of plywood and one strap in tension, we devised a system where, whereby you can get a pretty rigid uh, desk surface. 
um, from just securing it at those two points. Um, and then um, we tested that as part of a project that we did in Berkeley um, where uh, Kyle and Zaina pop up this table. And that we brought that then to a project um, that we were asked to do, a headquarters project by Meister Environmental Lawyers. And this is in the Banana Building um, in Boston. It's, it's near our government center. It's a kind of a notoriously difficult to work with building. Again, a kind of a modern relic of the, of the 1970s. Um, and we decided to eliminate all walls, or as many walls as possible, and to also eliminate all architectural finishes. Nothing, nothing. The whole thing is, is no VOC paint by Benjamin Moore and the ratchet strap furniture. So we completely eviscerated uh, the space. There was not much there to begin with. Um, we managed uh, the acoustics um, with some channeled wood, and we developed this furniture for the environmental lawyers that was like super ultra simple, all tied together with the ratchet strap. And the more we kind of got rid of, of architectural finishes, in a funny way, the kind of stronger the brand presence became. So it was a sort of a really odd example of kind of taking everything away but getting this sort of stronger image back. Um, we uh, took the floor plan and kind of squeezed all the private offices that the lawyers originally wanted into these little tiny kind of talk rooms. Um, we randomly programmed our router to go in and out of plywood um, to make acoustic grooves, which kind of revealed this sort of strange painterly kind of quality of where the uh, checks and boats that were in that plywood began to be apparent that you couldn't see from the surface. Um, it's kind of very super simple space. So it's a, this is the, the uh, US headquarters um, and the same cut files and the same strategy and the same generic products, the um, no VSC paint, the ratchet straps, and the tiny little bit of drywall that we still need um, for fireproofing are also available in um, uh, Northern Europe and also in Asia where they work. And then I'll just conclude um, with a kind of post-electrical vegetal world project that I'm working on with Michael Strano at MIT. It's the nanobionic plant. It's a plant lighting infrastructure, which is kind of like where all of these categories overlap. Nature, factory, unpacking the wall, and maybe also perpetual building. Um, it's kind of crazy. Um, this, is, this, is what, these, this is a skanky diagram at MIT. This, people are big on this. Um, but what we can see here is that forget what the source is. Nuclear, coal, gas, it doesn't matter. Basically, you need that much energy to get 1% of illumination. So there's a lot of waste right now with our electrical system, particularly when it comes to illumination. And plants um, are not just products. They're not things we eat or grow. Um, they're actually a technology in and of themselves, and they're an amazing uh, platform for technology, and they glow. Now, you may not be aware of this, but satellites can see this. So you're going to see very slowly in this video that North Spring is coming to Europe and North America, and Spring is coming now to Canada and a little bit north to Russia. And that's coming because those plants are giving off light. Um, they are fluorescing. The satellite eye can see them. The machine eye can see them. But we can't see them with our own eyes, although it is theorized that maybe birds can see the light of plants. But in Michael's lab, um, he is developing a way to introduce three coenzymes, some luciferase and two other coenzymes, into plants. This is not genetic modification. When these plants die, they're dead. So this is a partial, a partial augmentation um, of the plant's own electrical uh, platform that with the nanoparticles shifts the wavelength so that light can emit. And of course, uh, being an MIT lab, the very first thing um, that Michael and his team thought of was imprinting MIT, which you can see there glowing in these arugula lights. Um, so right now, we're really on to leafy green spinach or arugula watercress. It's all good, and you can eat it too afterwards. But what's amazing is that uh, plants actually communicate with chemicals. They talk to one another. And that when they have problems and issues, they tell their fellow plants that as well. Like, for example, insects are eating me. That's a chemical response and a signal that's sent to other neighboring plants. And so by sending these different chemical signals, Michael's team has been able to take the light-emitting plant and turn it on and off. We've also been working with slightly larger plants, um, taking the coenzymes and just using gentle air pressure or hand pressure to um, take the coenzymes and introduce them into the leaves of the plants. 
And so we're beginning to think about how you could at home take the coenzymes and just rub your own plant leaves with them and get a plantern or a lantern that is a plant. And we're beginning to look at the infrastructure, the systems by which this could happen with lotion, for example. Um, the leap, this is the leap process of rubbing on, how this could be in an apartment, it could be in a developing world, it could arrive by Federal Express, you could simply put it on to your plant, massage it on, and you would have a glowing plant that is bright enough to read a book by. So this is where we're at right now. Um, if you bring your book very close to the nanobionic plant, you can read by it. Um, and the plant is, the intensity of the plant light is, is growing and its duration is also growing. And I'll end with this image and idea of tree partners. Um, we're working, Michael and I, with a company in Thailand um, to work on tree partnering. Um, uh, humans taking care of, taking stewardship of trees that in return um, give them ambient urban light. So those are the three partial paradigms, and thanks for your patience in listening to us. I'm going to jump directly into it, so there will be very little of, of kind of summing up, because I don't think the body of work that you, that you shared and produced like, um, needs any of it. I um, have a couple of questions also coming out of uh, um, some of the things we discussed throughout studios today, but uh, also throughout sure. um, 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 core and like the material research that, that we are conducting in, in, in uh, um, the studios itself. So I was wondering, um, thinking about also like, like not just like uh, accessibility to technology, but then also sustainability in, in a larger sense and like how this uh, to a degree has changed and shifted ways the way we think about it throughout the last um, two decades. If you think about environmental technology and how it's applied, uh, also within the context of like um, how you guys apply it and applying kind of uh, something I want to underline mm -hmm. here, yeah. like how does this stance adjust if you look at like emerging practices vis-a-vis -vis to a degree like uh, technological accessibility and like how technology informs some of the things, the way we also rethink like sustainability within the built environment. Mm. So you're, you're, you're kind of wondering a bit like how does the, the, um, how do, the sort of the low tech, high tech, how do we think about accessing technology? Yes, or? but maybe like looking at the soft house in general where you introduce material very, very early um, yes, I see. As part um, of the design process, that yes. then like fundamentally informs in a way like a, a kind of very tectonic way of how the project behaves, right? Yes. Um, um, more so in an analog rather than like in an informative or or, or kind of um, um, technological way. Yeah. Well, just sense. just very quickly, I think I think uh, we do um, try to think about material early, um, and that's a kind of self-correction because I think mm -hmm. in the discipline um, we can go pretty far in a design process before really understanding what those surfaces and geometries that we're working on really are. And so um, from early on, we sort of made a commitment with, with the, the um, German government right. to make this uh, thick, solid wood house. And so that had gave some parameters into the project. Um, but we are interested in um, the project of taking back the wall, um, in this case, returning to actually what's a, what is a very ancient um, wood tradition that sort of fell out of favor um, around the time of World War II when the Germans were taught to use concrete and other uh, steel and other materials for their, for their houses after the war and, and also to fuel the kind of rebuilding effort in, in Germany. Mm -hmm. So those practices became lost and I think a lot of what we try mm -hmm. to do with materials and technologies is to remember um, to actually just deliberately go back and kind of remember those, those uh, those forgotten things that we've kind of developed a sort of cultural amnesia for um, and bring those to the forefront. So would you, would you say um, like light um, as a material or as a solar powered technology um, um, within the context of soft house but also within like some of your other projects like variables, adaptables, the scarf um, to a degree? Um, like reinforces like an idea of sustainability or visualizes it the one way or other as a kind of like haptic experience? Yes. Uh -huh. Well, it's true that the soft house um, and light itself is both tactile and right. optic. 
and you know through the lens of kind of modernism, the optic has been preferred, sure. right? So um, not, nonetheless, you do look at the curtains, but you can actually also touch them. So it's not really an escape from that modern idea of light as, as a thing that we see, but right. it's more kind of overlapping heat and light's capacity to also reflect heat, um, with, uh, which is part of the job that those, those curtains mm -hmm. do. Uh, yeah, I also think the, the, the word accessibility is interesting in the context of technology right. and infrastructure. And I think the, the key that we found working with infrastructure over the years is, and the challenge too, is the question of scalability. Uh, we, we are, I think, accustomed to thinking about infrastructure, let's see, from, the, from what we've inherited from modernism is mm -hmm. big, mm -hmm. very coarse, grand freeways, transportation, right. that kind of thing, right? And so as we begin to look at the kind of technologies that, are be, that continue to be developed, which are much closer to the kind of solid state, the micro, and even right. now, this, just the sensing, uh, then I think we're able to move between the scales much more quickly and even question some of those larger order course uh, infrastructure. So light, for example, is a perfect example of the scalability question. I mean, light, you know, you can deal with like right. solar technology and infrastructure, yet at the same time you can deal with light from the, from the finest, finest micro scale from the LED and then, you know, connect to the plant that itself, right? to the plant itself, right? So as a, as a practice that, that is both, and I think it's fair to say, like embedded in like uh, research and academia, like working within like um, um, the kind of like uh, um, culture yeah. environment from wearables to adaptables to adjustables. Like, is there, is there a point where you negotiate scale um, in regards to, okay, um, fabric picks up a certain kind of responsibility versus like a brick picking up another kind mm. of responsibility mm -hmm. within um, um, all the way to, I mean, you were both talking quite a bit about like the detail in the context of also like material technology, but from a very ephemeral um, 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 point, it was quite wonderful to see, particularly if you look at, and we earlier today spoke about the whole like off-white, like virtual upload approach, right? Mm -hmm. Like you change something 3% and all of a sudden it's something new again. And like, uh, this is great. And like, I, you know, love, love him. And uh, it was his <laughs> birthday yesterday, actually. Um, but the interesting thing is like, you are kind of like, not so much like in the 3% camp, right? Like, but more in the 97% camp uh, where you're very little off the shelf, it seems. I mean, the brick you could say is like mm. registered as a datum, but like the kind of, like everything else is more on the 97% side. Sometimes well, you even invent the problem. Right? True, we definitely invent the problem. Um, but um, I'm, I'm thrilled that you, you saw 97% of, of transformation. I would honestly say it is, <laughs> sometimes it is actually just, just 3%, but it appears, the trick is to make it appear uh -huh. to be 90, 96 or 97%. Um, <laughs> because, um, there, there, you know, there are many things that are standard, like you know, mm -hmm. dowels and pieces of wood mm -hmm. and bricks and concrete and plywood, and um, part of the whole kind of ethos of material misuse is the kind of idea that we can, or the yeah, the idea that we can receive standard materials mm -hmm. um, in their standard forms and um, you know, misuse them, take them beyond their prescriptive uses that they were quote unquote designed for or to do mm -hmm. and make from that a kind of new set of materials. But it's a little bit like, um, like the practice of everyday, uh, of, of everyday life, M Michel de Certeau, you're not creating de novo sure you're actually you know, inhabiting the apartment in different ways, or you're speaking a language just with an accent. There mm -hmm. are degrees mm -hmm. in which you um, can actually affect change, and mm -hmm. we can debate whether those are impactful or not. But the thing that has been most important to us is to try to um, challenge those corporate norms mm -hmm. Um, take back the wall, as I think in our in our ways, both of us have tried to say, while still and doing that while still being in practice. That's that's the trick, Great. right? Um, because the projects that you see at whatever scales are made 
with the exception of the MIT Nanobionic Plant right. Project, which is an academic research project, all the rest of those projects are projects mm -hmm. of practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the way things were set up between KVA and MADX, right. yeah. the relationship was never really the same. Uh, it wasn't equal. But as we work over time, I, I sometimes have a hard time finding a way to distinguish the two, so which has I'm, been the kind of the mission all along. The right. very clearly different structures, very different kind of funding structures, and mm -hmm. and now what's interesting is that they. Uh, be, I think, I think right. that's well, just the way debate. we're going. I mean, there's a big yeah. debate, isn't there, about about research in academia, right. um, about um, how effective it is. Um, we look at different historical models, Bauhaus, other, sure. um, and how do we, we do amazing mm -hmm. research inside schools of architecture, but how do we sort of then mm -hmm. um, make the scale jump and get that outside mm -hmm. and, and, and active in, in, right. in, in the non-academic environment? That's what was so interesting, I think, about the soft house, also sure. because of it being a, a governmental project, yes. right? Like it's sometimes hard to imagine and, and, and yes. within the kind of like the local and the context that we are in, True. Uh, or well, the yeah. other way around, like mm -hmm. thinking about mm -hmm. like not just like any house within like the kind of like German context, but also the, the passiveness. Yes. I mean, think like I like that you like stretch the terminology quite a bit. Yeah, Very an active house, do, really. Yeah, course. an active house that happens to meet the passive yeah. house code. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, it, like, I have one more thing. Like, when when you look at, uh, and, and to a degree, some of the most powerful tools in in, in thinking about efficiency, like uh, technology, sustainability, um, or a sustainable future future of of, of sorts, is. Uh, the one way or other, an, an engaged and very aware um, public. What are some examples that uh, uh, KVA approaches uh, in designing for engaged agents rather than simply inhabitants and users, particularly remembering you over many years, mm -hmm. like uh, stressing before like really anybody else and like also in your lecture today, that uh, you have spoken about the importance of not just like flexibility within space, but also flexibility and choice uh, in architecture from like large scale uh, approaches like your master plan uh, projects, mm -hmm. but then also choices like, of pattern. Way. Yes, right. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you want me to do yes. you yeah. jump in that? Um, users. I never really liked that word. Um, just confession and anecdotal, but um, both of our most recent studios right. have been adjacent to 12 step programs. Right. Um, one in the basement, and now our neighbors, Hope House, in, uh, a nonprofit right next door. So, users has a very, has a using and carrying, and, and has, a, has, a, right. has a, you know, a different kind of connotation. But I think people, I think it is perhaps borderline disrespectful to talk about the public as users, as if the public's sole role was to use something, mm -hmm. like to use it, to consume it, and then to discard it. Um, so I think that um, as many degrees of flexibility or choice, um, as many ways as possible to, within the limits of architecture, which are quite limiting, because when we open some systems, we like for, we, um, we, we close down others. That's the paradox of architecture, but I think to the extent possible, offering choice, offering flexibility, um, offering mm -hmm. difference mm -hmm. through engagement with a textile, a space, a room, um, a material, um, that would be the goal. Mm -hmm. What yeah. gender are your buildings? <laughs> What's that? What, what gender what are gender? your buildings? I think I Meister might be gender neutral, actually, the, um, the flat pack project, what do you think? Um, I'd say so. I mean, you know, the, one of the first projects we did was that was a uh, in a landmark cyclorama in Boston. If you ever go to Boston, you should see this building um, uh, that was built 150 years ago with the Gettysburg Battle um, uh, in a triptych. Fantastic. But uh, we were asked to, for accessibility reasons, mm -hmm. to switch the genders of the bathrooms. Uh, so we left the urinals in the women's room um, uh, because we were both, both cheap, uh, but also because we were interested in the material, the, por the beautiful porcelain, this combination uh, and blurring of the infrastructure, not the infrastructure of plumbing, uh, which we wanted to exploit as far as we could, but the infrastructure of, Water, of, of gender. So, yeah. um, 
Yeah. Um, arrival, I mean, I think what's interesting about that is that it's, you know, from the outside, right, you could say it's a male kind of phallic mm -hmm. object, but from the inside, it's definitely female, yet it's completely opaque. Mm -hmm. That is the quality of the new opacity, as you yeah. so eloquently expressed it. Um, the, I mean, the, the whole question of the user, though, does also, for me, <laughs> suggest a kind of, um, you know, the sort of service industry that right. we're supposed to be providing. Yeah. I mean, these mm -hmm. words like user and occupant mm -hmm. and that kind of thing, <laughs> yeah. and so, and then, you know, because I, I think one of the things that we're challenged right now by is the kind of the the agency that the, the autonomy of agency in architecture as a discipline that we have to mm -hmm. maintain, where everything is being blurred. You know, you're you're uh, you, you're both a, a, an architect and a writer, an architect and a teacher, right. architect researcher, right. and and architecture starts. I mean it starts to feel as though it begins to not take a second seat. So anyway, mm -hmm. we're the, one of the reasons we prototype, we have the workshop, we work with materials, we try to, we try to build as much as possible, is just to you know, put architecture in the face of people so in, that, in that way. When you, like in order to ensure that, uh, and, 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 and thinking about absolute like musts for KVA, yeah. Right. Uh, what would three of those musts be when you like design for M, him, per, her, them, Berg, mm. Sam here? Mm -hmm. um, it must have an idea. It must come from your imagination. Um, it must be manifested. Thank you. I know there is questions in the audience. Who wants the first? technical issues with it regarding how well the sun shading worked. So I was wondering if you had similar issues about how well um, these sun devices uh, are working, or I guess my question is, um, does the use of technology um, impact maintenance costs, which would also refer, refer to the, um, the concept of accessibility? Hmm. Um, I understand the gist of your question. Um, I think there is a difference. Um, the, the, the over, I understand the, the overarching arc of your, of your question, but I would just say that there is probably a difference between the Institut du Monde Arabe because that's a sort of highly mechanized um, system. So it's prone to failure. One could predict that that system would fail. Um, the twisters, the way that Jan and the team design them, are not so mechanical. They're really more geometric. It's about turning, um, and it's a mechanism that's been used in, in sails for a long time. And Hamburg is a kind of place of, of yachts and sails, and there's that winch technology, and there's a kind of a technological history that underlies the place that you know we didn't speak of. And then I think that um, we have not heard about complaints of maintenance from the owners, um, but then that would be the real estate developer who's really maybe fielding those questions and not the architect. But I guess behind your question, it's raising in my mind another question, which is of new technologies, we ask questions about maintenance like yours, but of the technologies that we take for granted, like curtain walls or uh, even, even wood frame construction or, or cavity wall brick, um, do we ask, do we scrutinize those same mainstream questions, uh, uh, um, wall typologies, as carefully as we do the new? I think it's really important to um, kind of be full 360 in our interrogation about maintenance and not just be sort of suspicious of the new. Yeah. Hi. Hi, um, my question is about the Plantern project. And um, so thinking about what you're talking about with accessibility, I was wondering um, if you're at a point in your research where you're able to say that the light is maybe self-distributing or how long that lasts like per application and what that maintenance would look like for a user and if it is, you know, what the usability is like. Yeah. Um, it's a little hard to say because that's an early on uh, project, but it's going to be appearing in May in a museum near you. Um, so you're going you're gonna to see it there and you can judge for yourself. 
Um, but right now, the goal is to create a kind of an enduring plant that takes some of its existing energy and um, converts that energy into light um, sufficient mm -hmm. enough to read a book if the book is really close to the leaves of the plant. And I think that we can do that. And if we can do that, I think it'll be a really big deal because it means that you can read with a plant. Uh, thanks for coming to Columbia. <laughs> um, I was really fascinated by your discussion from the city that must not be named, of course. But um, uh, I was really fascinated by your discussion of, of language. Um, in particular, because as someone who doesn't have an undergraduate training in architecture, I found entrance into architecture pedagogy very difficult um, when languaging. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested where your ethos came when communicating projects. Like, wh where, where does your, how does your spirit drive you to language something into twister, something so, so very clear to communicate kind of that object and its function? Hmm. <laughs> For me, that's always been a problem because I have a bilingual background and I have a hard time with language. So, I mean, personally, I depend a lot on just on drawing. I mean, on, on, on just illustrating, making, presenting in that language. But Sheila, on the other hand, don't you have a yeah, degree in Yeah, yeah. I, I have another degree and then other sets of interests. I have, I have a degree in, in, um, in history, uh, literature and philosophy, which is called College of Letters. Um, so I like words, um, and I think words really matter. Um, I think I used to, when I was younger, um, try to be very academic in my way of speaking. Um, and I don't know, I think it was as a result of working actually in the uh, Civic Institute project with Anna Devere Smith. I had the opportunity to work with her. And um, you know, she basically read me the riot act and, and just said, you know, you're turning your back on people, you're, you're looking at your slides and you're in a very hermetic discourse here, lady, um, and get out of that discourse. And, uh, and then a few years later, Gore uh, lost and um, people were looking at each other and just saying like, how can we communicate better? And I actually just made a resolution to just kind of like cut the academic jargon and just try to speak as clearly as possible about architecture and speak on behalf of architecture. Yes, we were talking about our projects, but I think KVA's main message mm -hmm. is that architecture is a force. Architecture can be political, um, not only by going outside of itself and then dragging uh, uh, issues back to the center of architecture, but understanding that the very center of the discipline is itself politicized by the materials mm -hmm. we use, the choices we make, um, and the way that we define and construct problems. So if that's one message that we've given t here, you know, I don't, I mean, I'm probably, we're probably speaking to the, to the converted already, but um, there's a, a inferiority complex amongst architects that we have no power, that, that uh, we're in this kind of highly developer world, the service industry, like Frano mentioned. And I would just say, no, that's not the case. It doesn't have to be that way. Hi, thank you so much for your lecture and your words. Um, I was really struck by <coughs> the <coughs> sorry, uh, the women's march that you showed at the beginning of the lecture side. And um, coming from a background in poli sci myself, I was wondering how you all thought the role of civic engagement plays to an architect. Um, and if you could elaborate on that and how maybe we could be empowered in ways to <laughs> civically engage people. Right, we, we've talked, we tried to talk about that in this talk, so just, I would say that for myself, um, getting out there is a good thing. I think we need active civic participation. Uh, you know, voting is essential, um, even if we think the system is broken, voting is essential. Um, um, uh, be, be being active and, and, and not being, a, being an active uh, participant is, is crucial, um, but all people can do that. What can we as architects uniquely do? How do we use our expertise? I'm going to use that word, that very contested word, expertise, at a time when kind of expertise is being questioned, right? Like, do we need it? But we go to school for a long time to be architects, and we do learn something, so we have a certain expertise to bring to bear. And I think what Frano and I have tried to communicate, try to say, is that um, we can 
look at how the external political situation affects the systems, the components, the materials that are typically used for architecture. And we can either hack those systems or create new systems um, or, or use a kind of process of detournement where we, where we kind of use jujitsu and turn those systems in a different way, but we can make change while still being in the system, while still practicing. Our particular response, and there are many responses out there that are viable, but ours is not to go into academia and do very few rare projects there, but rather to be in practice and to try to change practice from within. And, pr and, <clears throat> and also to put ourselves forward uh, into uh, working in, in, in the public domain where, where, where all eyes you challenge, yeah, all eyes are on you, where sure. you, you challenge the public to look at, at the work that you do as architecture that is, that is mm -hmm. making some kind of change. And as opposed to, you know, following the codes, you know, talking about, you know, being a service industry and all the things that 99.999% of architects do. So it's, it's, we do, we do follow the codes, though, I have to say. <laughs> Liability, pause. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I was very compelled by the strong dialogue in all, across all the projects between nature and technology and many variations, and I thought that was very interesting. So I guess my question is about workflow when you're presented with a new project or with, when you start a competition, how do you manage to link nature mm -hmm. and technology with your work without forcing it? Does it? Do you seek inspiration within it, or is it more of a natural flow? Mm. To work? Um, there, there are two, sort of two ways to think to think about that. Um, some are we were just talking about this in another context a, a few days ago. Um, some design problems are more top down, and some are bottom up. Um, a top down project would be uh, like the Selco uh, Relamp project, which is on our on our website. But we were approached by a company in India, and they wanted to change the materiality of their um, street lights and use uh, grow that material instead of having it be uh, concrete and steel and all of that. So we knew already that from that we were making a street light or making a home lamp or whatever it was, and we had to look around for um, natural materials in the vicinity to do that. So that's an example of kind of top down process. A bottom up process is one where you start with a material like linen. I would say clima mm -hmm. is kind of bottom up. You, you, we, we knew we were working with linen, um, but we didn't know a thing about linen, even less about French linen. Um, and you know, there's a whole kind of cultural history about French linen as well. So you, know, you go, you visit, you look, um, and you form impressions. Uh, research is also highly subjective. Um, that we're, we're partial to it. That's why it's mm -hmm. also a partial paradigm. Not only is it imperfect, but it's, it's, par it's partial to us. We're, we're partial to it. Um, and then you develop a set, you understand a set of, of, of properties that a particular material gives you, and then you, in, in the case of Klimala, think about how to augment them. So we were sort of able to steer them away mm -hmm. from, let's say, illuminating linen to having it use its main superpower, which is absorption, and just sort of augmenting that with some new capacity. Yeah, the, the kind of nature technology thing, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's hard to do uh, in this country because there's just an abundance of resources and it, there's sometimes a kind of, you know, a deafness to, to that. So we, we, it doesn't say that we, we, we won't work that way and we can't work that way, we're here. Mm -hmm. But some of the, one of the things about the, the MADX side of the studio is that it's allowed us to go into areas where there is, the, the resources aren't there, like this project that Sheila's talking about, or like Portable Light Project. And there's a, there's a question of need and necessity, which is absolutely key to like spark that invention, that imagination. 
And, and these are these, that, that, that's been the service in some ways that, that Maddox has provided us is these, this ability to practice, mm -hmm. practice at stuff. And like, you know, we've failed so many times, you know, like horror stories about some of these smaller projects. In the end, we, we, we hopefully succeed because we've tried so hard. But, you know, it's going to places where there is no technology. So where do you, where do you even begin? You start with like, water or like plants or light or uh, and then then it's a question of oh okay well maybe we can bring the technology well we can't bring a solar panel here because it's like it weighs 500 pounds so let's try to find a flexible solar panel does anybody have you know you know textile backed flexible solar so you know these questions wouldn't have happened I don't think if we didn't put ourselves in a position this kind of impoverished position where there's nothing here, where do we, where do we even begin? Then you apply those to places like mm -hmm. Hamburg. Because Hamburg in some ways started in, Brazil, in, in Mexico. Mm -hmm. and, 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 un, and understanding how we could then right. scale up. What you're saying is that each project, in a way, as you, as you get older, right, each project um, communicates its lessons to the next, so there's kind of a cascading effect, so things become kind of enriched. Um, but you see that in your own studio work over the years, too, I'm sure. Um, you know, like, you look at all of your studio work and you realize, oh, I have tendencies. You know, like, I do certain things the same way, or I have these same interests across these different kinds mm -hmm. of programs, and it's the same right. in a practice, too. There's room for one last, okay, question. Sorry, Alec. Hello. Um, so at the beginning of the talk, you were introduced uh, and explained as um, kind of rejecting formality in favor of the performative. Yes. And that was interesting <laughs> to me because um, you seem to have found like a very key balance between the performative and making it also somewhat formal. So I'm wondering if, the performative, whether that's uh, bringing agency to uh, people who utilize the spaces that you design, or something else, like what kind of would you consider as your most powerful tool in impacting change in architecture, and then how does that translate over to students who are constantly challenged to find that balance between formality, but mm. also changing the practice I as see, they I practice, see. as you said before. Mm. Um, and you also mentioned opacity before, like the power between the power of a narrative that has not settled on one particular narrative. So perhaps it's like, as you said, reaching out and then bringing something back into the center of architecture, interdisciplinarity, the performative, like, yeah, what has you, have you found been to like be very key tools for impacting Whoa. change? Well, Christoph said one question. <laughs> That's Sorry. a lot. Um, <laughs> Good one. No, that, but that kind of gets at the moment that we're in, in some ways, because uh, I, I think, you know, having, looking at architecture, architecture, you know, from a critical standpoint, it, you know, requires you to start thinking about how you practice it, and especially, although I don't teach that much, but how you, how, when you do, how you teach it, uh, and is it always, is, is it always the same kind of, um, uh, done, done the same way? So I think that the, from the, the student standpoint, I can tell from experience that there is a real interest in a kind of balance uh, between uh, this kind of digital, you know, computational world that we are in right now and uh, the idea of the tactile, the, act, the idea of the material. So, I mean, that's what we do. And um, I think there's a kind of a, a uh, a, a, an attraction to to that, the kind of do by learning um, a, aspect, which we don't tend to do as architects because someone else does it for us. So, mm -hmm. you know, having the shop, uh, having the ability to, you know, work with materials and make things even as small as they are, I think that that's, that, that's key. And I think that that's uh, something that is, uh, is really important doing the profession. Otherwise, you, you end up, you, you end up, the, the challenge is that when you go into the profession, you're inheriting a profession which is decades and decades old and it will change very slowly, not in your lifetime. So what are you gonna do? 
What are you going to do about that? You got to change it. And you got to change it though from before you get in. Because if you get into the profession um, without that kind of critical thinking mm -hmm. um, and that, that desire to, to, to change, uh, then, then it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a beast. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm op I am very optimistic. I don't mean to sound like this is not possible at yeah. all. Yep, it is possible and you guys are gonna to need to do it. By the way, KVA is hiring. <laughs> That's not a joke, um, so. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Yes, thank you.